It is a well-known fact that J.R.R. Tolkien presented his legendarium as a pseudo-history, complete with a cast of lore masters and a mode of transmitting key historical texts. As I've studied this aspect of his work over the years, I've become increasingly conscious, sometimes to the point of all, at the pervasiveness and depth of the pseudo-historical devices he employed. It is one thing to name-drop the occasional lore master or allude to an imagined oral tradition. Many authors do that, in an attempt to create the illusion of depth that Tolkien valued so much. But Tolkien's creation of a pseudo-history reminds me of a sentence from the Silmarillion, about the Valar. An Arda might seem a little thing to those who consider only the majesty of the Ainur, and not their terrible sharpness, as who should take the whole field of Arda for the foundation of a pillar and so raise it until the cone of its summit were more bitter than a needle, or who consider only the immeasurable vastness of the world, which still the Ainur are shaping, and not the minute precision to which they shape all things therein. Tolkien excelled, of course, at creating what he termed vast backcloths of imagined history, but he also manipulated language and point of view in subtle ways to create that sense of depth and historicity. Tolkien always imagined his legendarium as part of a living tradition, passed on across hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Critical consensus has typically favored what Tolkien called a mannish mode of transmission. In this mode, the myths and stories of the Silmarillion are written, translated, redacted, and presented by, the, by Numenorean lore masters, not the elven lore masters, namely Pengaloth, whom Tolkien had placed at the heart of his invented tradition for 30 years. The Numenorean mode of transmission reflects Tolkien's stated intentions during work on the Silmarillion during the late 50s and early 60s. This leaves uncertainty as to who exactly wrote the text we know as the Silmarillion. Were these elven texts translated by Numenorians without commentary? Or, as many critics seem to imply, does the change in the mode of transmission suggest that, in the Silmarillion, we hear the stories of the Eldar told in Numenorean voices? Before I present my data on bias, it is essential to establish who is telling the story. I've no doubt that Tolkien intended to revise the mode of transmission. I just don't think he actually did it, leaving this so-called mannish mode in the same murky, ambiguous state as the radical cosmological revisions he pondered at the same time. He also failed to affect these revisions to his cosmology in any consistent, meaningful way, and for the same reason as he also never affected the revisions to the framework or mode of transmission. To do so cuts to the very bones of the story and is not lightly undertaken. A Numenorean perspective on elven texts is necessarily going to be very different than that of Elfwina. Looking at the stories themselves is where I'll begin to show that any intention toward a Numenorean mode of transmission never touched the point of view of the Quenta Silmarillion, which remained elven, and specifically Pengaloth's for most of the text. The second phase of what is called the later Quenta Silmarillion in the History of Middle-Earth series was written around the same time as Tolkien began pondering the Numenorean revision. Notably, Tolkien removes all mentions of Pengaloth, who was present in the first draft of the same text, which has been suggested by me and others as a potential indicator that Tolkien meant to minimize or even eliminate Pengaloth's role in the process of transmission. But there's not much evidence beyond that surface change, and the point of view of this document remains distinctly elven. Verlin Flieger noted that, since myths are culture-centric, the attitude of each people toward death is bound to be different, and further identified death as, quote, the major dividing line between Tolkien's two peoples. Yet Tolkien never undertook revisions on this point in the Silmarillion materials. Death remains a gift in the Silmarillion, and where mortals are concerned, largely a mystery. Mortals clearly see it differently. This is a distinctly elven perspective. Furthermore, in the later Quenta Silmarillion, he adds eschatological material in the form of the statute of Finway and Muriel. Again, this represents an elven point of view. It is impossible to imagine a Numenorean writer penning elven history and representing this strictly elven point of view. The Numenoreans are a culture defined by, and whose downfall was predicated upon, an obsession with death. Any writings originating with them, whether or not they are about the elves, must necessarily reflect this key cultural characteristic. But this is why the changed... It is quite another to tinker with the deep metaphysical machinery that drives the central conflict of the story. Christopher Tolkien elected not to include an explicit metafictional framework for the published Silmarillion, eliminating, for example, any reference to the lore master who wrote or translated a particular text. 
This allowed him to avoid making a definitive decision on the question of an Elven or Numenorean mode of transmission. The Silmarillion, however, is replete with references, both direct and subtle, to the sources from where the narrator's information comes. I took a closer look at these references with a mind to ascertain what I could of the narrator's sources, especially gaps in the authoritative information to which he had access, to see what these references revealed of the narrator. The gaps in authoritative information are particularly revealing about the narrator's identity. There are times when he implies a source of information, but omits any further detail about who exactly provided this information. This suggests that the narrator lacks eyewitness knowledge, but also doesn't know the source or doesn't believe the source carries enough authority to warrant identification. The narrator generally uses three phrases to signal this. It is said, it is told, and it is sung. These phrases remind me of when my middle school students can't remember where a particular fact came from and attempt to hide their ignorance behind a vague phrase like, people say. They recognize that they need a source, but aren't actually sure who that source is. This vague phrase seems to function similarly. Combined, the three phrases, it is said, it is told, it is sung, are used more than 40 times in the Silmarillion, without further detail about who is saying, telling, or singing. As I began to focus on their use, I noticed a pattern behind when they were used, compared to when the source was identified. The data here shows that the narrator tends to avoid identifying his source when referring to specific groups of characters. The two groups where the narrator most often lacks an authoritative sor source are the Ainur and the mortals, but some of the groups where the formula is used far less often also make my point equally well. The Quendai of Kuavayenen and the Nandor are infrequently mentioned in the Silmarillion, yet the formula is used for these groups even in those few mentions, where it is barely employed for groups like the Sindar and Noldor, who are constantly discussed. When it is used for the Sindar and Noldor, furthermore, it is often used in situations where the narrator would necessarily have lacked reliable knowledge, such as a private conversation between two people or a character's thoughts. These data suggest that the narrator is not immortal, but most likely Noldoran or Sindarin, the groups about whom he seems to possess the most authoritative sources. Now one could correctly make the argument that the Silmarillion was not composed as a single text, but as a compilation of pieces taken from texts written over the span of decades. However, if Tolkien had seriously endeavored to make revisions reflecting a change from an Elven to a Numenorean tradition, these changes would likely reflect in the second phase of the later Quintus Silmarillion, a rewrite of Silmarillion material embarked upon after Tolkien wrote the note declaring the tradition a mannish affair. Tellingly, the second phase incorporates some of the radical cosmological revisions he pondered at the same time, referring to the Dome of Varda, but in no way suggests a change in point of view. At the broadest possible level, Tolkien added texts, namely the Statute of Finway and Muriel, that are impossible to imagine as written by a Numenorean. At the minute level, his use of the it is said, told, sung formula shows that the narrator possessed eyewitness knowledge or an authoritative source for material about the Eldar, but not other groups of characters. This leads me to conclude that no matter Tolkien's intentions, his actual writings retained Pengaloth as a narrator, even when given the chance to make revisions during the second phase of the later Quintus Silmarillion. And Pengaloth is an interesting choice for a narrator, commenting broadly on the First Age despite spending most of it cloistered inside the hidden city of Gondolin. The Silmarillion says of Gondolin, Shut behind their pathless and enchanted hills, tidings of the land beyond came to them faint and far, and they heeded them little. Quendai and Eldar says of Pengaloth specifically that he, quote, collected much material among the survivors of the wars concerning languages and gesture systems with which, owing to the isolation of Gondolin, he had not before had any direct acquaintance. It seems a reasonable assumption that he'd be equally naive of the history of peoples other than his own, and eventually of the Doriathrum refugees. Tolkien seems to be deliberately setting up the bulk of the Quintus Silmarillion tradition to be told by a narrator who is shockingly uninformed about all but a tiny portion of what transpired in the era and people of which he writes. Nor does Gondolin strike me as exactly an intellectually permissive environment. Turgon its king is described in the Silmarillion as, quote, unappeasable in his enmity for Feanor and his sons. Not without reason, of course, 
But I have to question whether Pengaloth had access to perspectives other than those of his king, and the kinds of people willing to shut themselves in under that king's rule for their foreseeable future, or whether he would have been allowed to represent those perspectives, even if he did. Alex Lewis, in a 1992 paper presented at the J.R.R. Tolkien Centenary Conference, first suggested historical bias in the Silmarillion. Lacking access to the later History of Middle-Earth volumes that treat the issue of the lore masters more fully, Lewis concluded that the Silmarillion reflects the bias of Elrond, showing distinct favoritism towards Gondolin and Doriath, and antipathy towards the Feanorians, because of Elrond's parents. Lewis makes a good case for Elrond as the source of bias, but Pengaloth fits those biases even better and is a documented source for many of the texts that Lewis identified as partisan. I had accepted the Silmarillion as bias, and authored in the main by Pengaloth, for many years before encountering Lewis's work, because this was a prevalent idea in the Tolkien fan communities where I spent most of my time discussing and writing about the Silmarillion. Last year, I sought to see whether I could quantify this bias. Lewis analyzes passages from the text to find bias, sometimes claiming that certain characters or groups of characters received more attention than others, and using this as an indicator of bias. I was curious if this claim could be st supported statistically. Following Lewis's lead, I considered a relative lack of detail as an indicator of negative bias. I looked at four different measures using the Quintus Silmarillion. The first and simplest measure looked at how many times key characters were mentioned in the Quintus Silmarillion. References in the index of names were not counted. The number of times the narrator mentions a character seems a reasonable mark of the narrator's interest in that character. In addition, characters whose points of view and motives receive deep analysis would likely receive more attention from the narrator than those whose points of view are ignored and motives unexplored. I'd like to focus on the ten most mentioned characters. Only one character, Feanor, is not associated in some way with Gondolin or Doriath, or someone who receives special affection from Turgon, in the cases of Fingolfin and Finrod. None of the sons of Feanor make the top ten list, and when they are mentioned, the narrator relishes recounting their misdeeds while glossing over their assets and accomplishments. These results show a strong preference for Gondolin and Doriath, the expected preferences of one who grew up in Gondolin and mingled with the Doriathrum refugees at the mouth of Syrian, or Pengaloth. Next, I looked at the establishment of realms, one of the most important activities in the Quenta Silmarillion, a text that includes an entire chapter on who went and built what where. Achievement of a culturally and aesthetically rich settlement that is safe from the enemy appears to be a strong metric of a particular character or culture's success in the mind of the narrator. Lewis noted discrepancies in the amount of time the various realms in the Silmarillion are given relative to each other. I attempted to quantify his claim by counting the number of words used to describe different realms in the Quenta Silmarillion. Once again, the narrator shows bias towards Gondolin and Doriath, the realms receiving most of his attention. In third place is Nargothrand, another hidden realm and belonging to Turgon's friend, Finrod. The fourth most mentioned realm is particularly notable. Nevrest, a realm of only glancing importance in the Silmarillion. Nevrest is the kind of place you include in Tolkien pub trivia when you're trying to stump everyone but the deep nerds. But the narrator lingers on it more than he does even the realm of the heroic King Fingolfin. Pengaloth, of course, was born in Nevrest, and it is probably one of the few places he could describe from memory. It's important to note here the realms that don't get mentioned very often, those of the Feanorians. Accustomed as we are to seeing the Silmarillion through Pengaloth's eyes, it's worth taking a step back and considering what these realms truly represented. The realms of the Sons of Feanor occupy the geographically vulnerable stripe of land that offers easiest access to Beleriand by the forces of Morgoth. Even Pengaloth admits that Mithros chose his realm because, even after the prolonged torture at the hands of Morgoth, he was, quote, very willing that the chief peril of assault should fall upon himself. The same isn't said of his brothers, but one needs only look at a map of Beleriand to make that inference. The sons of Feanor form the bulwark between Angband and those splendid realms upon which the narrator of the Silmarillion lavishes his attention. That the Feanorian realms were largely annihilated after the surprise attack of the Battle of Sudden Flame is proof of that peril. But the narrator of the Silmarillion says almost nothing about them. We don't know what, if anything, they built. We don't know anything about their people, 
We may know something about their natural features, but otherwise they are a literal and literary blank on the map. This omission is difficult to pardon as anything but bias, an unwillingness to learn about or discuss the homelands of one's enemies, even when those enemies provide a layer of protection that suggests a need for reparation or courage at the least. Battles are another important recurring type of event in the Silmarillion, and I turn there next. Especially among the minor battles, the number of words used to tell of them and the way they are described again suggest bias against particular characters. Several battles occur in the text that function to maintain peace and yet are unnamed and in fact devalued by the narrator of the Silmarillion. Major actors in these devalued battles are the Feanorians and Fingon, a character whom multiple measures in my study showed as a surprising recipient of bias from the narrator. Fingon is Turgon's brother, but of course, he is also one of the few characters acknowledged as maintaining friendship with the Feanorians. The battles in which Fingon took the lead are so devalued, not only glossed over, but presented in negative terms despite their positive outcomes, that I was forced to name them myself, the Not Great Battle and Battle 4.5. This was not reckoned among the great battles, says the narrator about the battle that ensured that, quote, there was peace for many years and no open assault from Angband. Similarly, Fingon's decisive removal of Glaurung as a threat for many years is given scant attention, barely 100 words and many of those spent describing how Fingon almost lost. The Battle Under Stars, one of the most decisive victories by the Noldor and Beleriand, is described by Lewis as, quote, dismissed in 17 lines and subtly devaluing Feanor's courage by insinuating that it was a fit of battle rage or berserker action. In contrast, the small battles won by the Sindar are not similarly qualified. The first battle fought by Thingol and Denethor is the fourth longest in the Quintus Silmarillion. The Battle of Brethil is small but nonetheless named, but Beleg of Doriath is one of its chief actors. The battles that receive the most attention are those that were lost. One can conclude from this that Pengaloth was a pessimist who enjoyed dramatizing the failures of his people, or, more likely, that those battles most heavily involved participation from those closely associated with Gondolin, Doriath, and Nargothrand. Every battle that receives more than 300 words in the text involves characters associated with at least one of these kingdoms. Finally, I looked at perhaps the most common type of event in the Quintus Silmarillion, death scenes. Seventy named characters meet their ends in the pages of the Quintus Silmarillion, itself a remarkable statistic. Counting words proved to be ineffectual. Death scenes are so often entangled with surrounding plot events that deciding what counts and what doesn't foiled my attempts at quantifying death scenes as I did character mentions, realms, and battles. Instead, I looked at funeral customs, and which characters are identified as receiving mourning, a funeral rite, or both. A few observations come immediately to mind. Those who receive funerals in the text, mourning, or both are, with the exception of Glaurung and Kim, positively depicted in the text and characters of significance. The list of those for whom no funeral or mourning is described comprises enemies and minor characters from whom one would not expect much attention in the narrative including all members of groups for whom the Sindar and Noldor generally felt enmity. Also included are all of the Feanorians. Feanor's death scene, in particular, glaringly omits any mention of an emotional reaction on the part of his sons. Likewise, if the sons of Feanor memorialize or grieve for their fallen brothers in some way, it is not mentioned. Here we also see the emergence of bias against the family of Arathel. Aeol and Maeglin, obvious enemies of Gondolin and therefore Pengaloth, are treated similarly to the Feanorians. The effect of these omissions is to deny the most normal and empathetic emotions, grief, to characters for whom Pengaloth may have possessed a vested interest in depicting as lacking such relatable human emotions. What does it mean that the Silmarillion is biased, as I hope I've showed that it is? At the very least, I believe it begins to reveal the full extent of manipulations Tolkien undertook to provide that sense of depth. To return again to the Silmarillion quote about the Valar, not just the immeasurable vastness of his imagined history, but the minute precision at which he worked subtly to communicate this. I believe it also brings implications for interpreting the text, inviting the question of how near Pengaloth, or Rumil, or Bilbo, or any of the fictional lore masters, 
approximated Tolkien's own views of what the reader was to take from the stories of Middle-earth. 